This is Cher, and I'm here with Jason and Rob. Guys, if you had to describe this podcast in five words or less, what would you say? I'm going to go with Wild E. Coyote guzzling gasoline. I'm thinking climate change diarrhea hurricane. (laughs) Are you serious? Maybe I should do this thing on my own. Fine. It's a show about how to stay sane in a world where there's too many people consuming too much stuff and the planet can't take it anymore. Mm -hmm. You had me at diarrhea. Caution. If you're allergic to four-letter words, you might want to try a different podcast. So, you know, I was invited to give this talk uh, a couple weeks ago in town here. And uh, the the local sustainability coalition does this event every year, kind of a town hall, and they asked me to speak. And uh, I was talking to my my oldest son, who was eleven at the time. He actually just turned twelve, about whether he wanted to go or not. You know, he's actually never had a chance to see me speak. He knows a bit about the work that I do, but he uh, he has never actually seen me sort of talk in public. And so I asked him if he wanted to go, and I secretly really wanted him to go. I wanted him to be proud of his dad. I wanted him to like see me in action, you know? Right. And uh, it was kind of a big deal to me. And he said to me, no, I don't want to go. Why? That's what I asked him. I said, why? And of course I was trying to like lay low, not put pressure on him, you know? You're cool. And uh, he's like, yeah, all the, every time I go to these kinds of events, I find them really depressing, Uh you know? Like all these people talking about all the things that we should be doing that are just obvious, you know? Why can't we just do them, you know? Oh, jeez. And uh, here he is, 11 years old. He's already been sort of exposed to this stuff enough. You know, these issues that we're talking about climate change, you know, we're talking about trying to get people to use less fossil fuels and the impact on the planet and biodiversity loss, all this stuff, you know, he's been exposed to probably mostly through my work, you know, at Post Carbon Institute. But he's already at that point. He's like, just, it's, I don't want to hear it anymore. And what's really telling about that is, you know, he's not wanting to go to an event where these are the the people that do care, right? right. And he's already depressed there. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, it's really tough. Yeah. And so I, you know, it's, it's something I have wrestled with ever since I had kids. I mean, I, I got into this work. I started working on climate change issues right after he was born. He was six months old when I quit my job. And, um, you know, I was already doing nonprofit work. I was already a person who kind of was lucky enough to dedicate myself to, to, to work that was about helping people in, in various issues. Um, but I had not done any environmental work. And uh, like other people, I was really impacted by an inconvenient truth and decided I was going to shift my, my professional focus. And it was really about him, him coming into this world and me being concerned about his, his future. And it's been interesting for the last dozen years since mm-hmm. that point because I don't want to give him false hope. You know, I don't want to... I felt like when I first started working on climate change issues, one, it was easier because I didn't have to worry about talking to him about this shit. You he's know, like, little, yeah. he was just a little kid. And I and I would come home every day and I was like, I felt this, like, deep connection to the fact that, okay, I'm doing this to work directly because of you and my concern for, for your future and well-being and, and other kiddos out there, you yeah. know. And then as he got older, I think my understanding of these issues also got deeper and more complex. And you combine those two things, it became a real challenge for me because, like, shit, the world is pretty heavy, you know? And I think kids, God, I'm going to sound like an old man, but kids these days are exposed to a lot more than I was, right? you know, because of the internet and, you know, what have you. So that School they're... curriculum's updated, I think. You think it is? I think there's more <laughs> in it, yeah. But... But I mean, all kinds of issues, you know, uh, social justice issues, you know, environmental issues. They, they look at the political system. He's already so goddamn cynical about the political system, wow. you know. And uh, and uh, let's be honest, I'm sure I'm a huge disproportionate yeah, yeah. influence. This is that, the this is the trouble. You're way way too thoughtful, and uh, you talk too much. I talk yeah. too much. Yeah. <laughs> so so I'm too uh, honest about so that. I I got into this line of work for the money. So I, oh, I right right the, sure. The you know, unlike you, I'm not yeah. trying to do any good. I'm I'm raking it in. Right. Yeah. 
and uh, for my daughter, I just gave her a copy of Cormac McCarthy's The Road and just said, here, <laughs> you're three, read this, <laughs> understand it, and that's get a shopping cart, and that's what you're doing from now on. Don't go in the basement, <laughs> right? whatever you do. Yeah. Don't, 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 yeah, that's our food seller. It bumps every once in a while. Don't worry about it. It's just fresh. That's all. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, so I don't know how you guys deal with this stuff. I mean, we all have kids, right? So, and our kids are different yeah. ages, um, and they all have different personalities. But I'm at this place where it's not just now about doing this work and doing the best I can for my kids. You know, it's also about how do I even prepare them for this future, and how do I yeah. talk to them honestly about this well, stuff? I I had a experience recently that, that might shed a little light. I My daughter called me and I talked to her on the phone and, and said, uh, you know, how's it going? I always ask her that. And she, she said, well, I'm sad and depressed. And I'm like, oh, well, what's wrong? And, and then she said that I just learned a little bit ago that the last male northern white rhino died. And I was like, oh. And, and then she actually started crying wow. like a, a little bit. You know, you could hear the tears welling. I don't know if I can hear tears welling up, but she started tearing and then it was a pretty hefty cry. Like she was truly sad and she started questioning, like, why do I even go to school? And, and she was uh, 12 at the time, almost 13 and uh, said, why, why do I even go to school? Like, we're studying history. What does that even matter when this is how we treat the planet? And, right. and uh, God, I was, uh, as a father, I was just stumbling and, and bumbling. Like I, I, I couldn't come up like I wanted to comfort her, but there wasn't really anything to say because the the fact she was right the the rhino died and what the what the hell are we doing? So uh, I, I kind of just sat with it a little bit, and then the first thing I I think the first smart thing I said to her was, uh, "You're right to feel angry and upset. Just validate those feelings. Oh, that's very good. Because yeah. they how could you not?" be upset if you have a sense of what's going on, especially with animals. I mean, kids love animals. And you, if you, you know, you're reading books to your kids about the animals, you go to a, maybe you see a zoo or, or out in the forest, but everybody poops. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, a great one. book. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's but, on that bedside table. <laughs> but the, the next thing that I, that we got to was, um, you know, you can't wave a magic wand and bring the rhinos back or all the species that we, you know, passenger pigeons or dodos or, you know, take your pick or fix the ecosystems. But what you can do is try to say and do things that could help. And you never know how far your words or your actions are going to go. And so we talked about, you know, you, you could write something and we could try to get it published and maybe that would help inspire some others to care. So we started working on that and and she kind of she kind of one of the things she wrote in the essay that she put together, she said it it sucks being sad about this stuff, but that doesn't really do you any good. And and that made me feel kind of heartened that that she would at least try. You know, we might fail, but at least try and and there's honor in in doing that. Yeah. Well I also think that 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 feeling, that strong feeling, is then a motivating force to our action to some extent. So I, I, I worry more if, if there's no care, honestly. So I think that's right to validate that. Yeah. I think it's just hard to... How do you maintain the openness and the, the sensitivity right, to all you get, this? Right, you get fried. When you... I mean, I think it's I think it's fantastic that you encourage her to to write about this and communicate. I think even if that doesn't change anybody else, it could be cathartic mm -hmm. to kind of get it off your chest and to feel like you're you're doing something with it. I do worry that the disconnect between what they feel like they can do, any of us as individuals, frankly, can do, and the scale and the enormity of this unfolding nightmare that we're dealing with, you know, how do you maintain that? How do you maintain being present with that and acting and somehow feeling like, okay, my actions make a difference, but you actually, if you're honest with yourself, like if you can be honest with yourself enough about the fact that we're fucked in this way, all this shit is happening, then you're going to have to be probably pretty honest with yourself that 
writing a blog post or contacting your elected representative or whatever the hell it is, you know, uh, riding your bike to school is not going to actually bring a rhino back or, yeah. you know. Well, the, the main way to deal with it is to crush up some rhino horn into a drink and yes. you feel a lot better when, yeah. you, when you drink that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, I hear you. And I mean, we, we as adults try this, right? We were like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll use less fuel or I'll agree to, uh, you know, what is it? Vegetarian Mondays or, you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever, uh, you know, whatever things you want to throw out there that are, are lessening your impact. But the truth of the matter is we're in a system that has too much impact and we're all uh, complicit in it and, you know, but I, I think trying to change that system is the only thing that you can you can possibly do. And uh, taking your best shot at that, both you and helping children understand that that's their role. You know, and it's it's not fair necessarily, but they they've got to they've got to build a different world than what what our ancestors built and what we built. Yeah, it's 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 such a funny thing because sometimes I feel like you know I'm not doing enough to sort of shelter and protect my my kids from this stuff. Sometimes I feel like I'm not doing enough to prepare them, right. you know, and I'm not talking to them honestly enough about this. And then I try to remember <laughs> when you, when you take a bit of a historical perspective on this, our kids, you know, I'm, I'm speaking specifically about my kids because I am of a certain socioeconomic level. They've got, uh, you know, they're, they're pretty high up on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, these sure. kids, you know, and they're living in a wait, time. Wait, wait, I think you're going to have to give me a refresher on Maslow. Okay, so Maslow, you know, the, the, it, it, there's kind of this pyramid that, that represents this hierarchy of needs that this guy Maslow sort of came up with, you know, and it's basically like, you know, your, your subsistence stuff. Breathing. You know, at, the, at the bottom, <laughs> working your so, way so up. So you're talking about like you're living a better life the higher up this pyramid Yeah, you go. and it's... Okay. It's basically like, you know, if you don't take care of the foundation of this thing, the bottom levels, you can't get to these higher right, levels. Right, like, like if I'm not getting food, then yeah. I'm pretty miserable. Yeah, if you're not getting yeah. food, if you, you you're not getting shelter. Violin. Yeah, you're not, you're not going to be going, you know, and getting an advanced degree or something like that, right. you know. My boys have, are really lucky. And if you think about it from a historical perspective, they're extremely lucky. If you, if you actually look at, at the fate of all organisms over time, right? Right. right. <laughs> these... <laughs> Homo sapiens born in this, you know, at the period that they were born in, yeah. uh, even with this kind of toxic knowledge that they, they have to carry around if we expose it to, you know, to them, are still inordinately lucky. It wasn't that long ago that my 12-year-old son would be working in a fucking factory or at least on the farm, yeah. you know? And so, you know, I try to remind myself of a bit right. of perspective. That like, life is hard, you know? Like... They've got it pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's if our children or us, if we survived all the diseases, the you know, that the would have wiped us out too. I mean, that's yeah. It, no, that's it's, a very interesting conundrum to think about. Like to hold that we're very fortunate, but then also to be willing to say we also are not ready for a future that maybe won't have all this fortune. Right. And that's sort of what I get into is when you've got kids who are really happy, just like uh, getting on their devices and putting on their headphones and there's all that stimulus of the technology. And really you thinking to yourself, uh, you know, I'd really love that if they could grow potatoes <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, and, you know, maybe we should be collecting the, the dropping acorns and learning how to leech them. And maybe we should be figuring out like when that deer walks through in the fall, how to, how to take that down and <laughs> skin it and use the sinew for something purposeful. I don't know. So that's a, you know, that's what you're thinking. I, I think I juggle that. Like, so, how do you, how do you draw them out of the present? And at the same time, I've got kids who are aware as well. Yeah. You've got older kids. They're 19. Yeah. So they're 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 aware of how screwed up it is, but they're also tapped into the lifestyle. 
Oh, that it's so easy just to go along with. Yeah, and we're we're. I mean, our our kids are hypocrites. We're hypocrites. I mean, it's uh, that's what I was getting at. Living in this system, right? But what I want to you, you started talking a share about the kind of the looking at it through the sweep of history. I want to look at it through the sweep of '80s movies. Okay. So <laughs> all right. So yeah. do you, does that mean that you want to go all Sarah Connor, Terminator, and uh, you know turn your children into? Uh, resistance uh leaders and incredible fighters okay. and uh you know and the, yeah. they, they can do what jason was just talking about like rip a tendon out of a deer make a bow and hunt up tomorrow's meal let's do this <laughs> that's a that's a really great question i think i really honestly wrestle with what skills do they need to be prepared for the future right and and part of the challenge with that is that um, I try to I try to caution myself against actually predicting the future. Right. Right. So, because if if the the scenario was this this acute Seneca cliff type of collapse, Seneca cliff being basically like when we talk about collapse of of society, you know, you use that word and people have this like Armageddon vision right. in their head. That's a Seneca cliff. That's like a sudden. You know, immediate kind of collapse. Like, like asteroid hits the planet. Kind yeah, of and in, in in this case, it doesn't have to be an asteroid. It could be basically that the industrial you know, fossil fueled growth and debt paradigm. A solar flare causes an EMP. Well, that's and- uh, we don't even go that far, right? Like it's just that the, the system. This I'm worried about com- that though. Uh, sure, of course, but you're you're living in the right place for that. Okay, um, that this system is you know unwinds itself really could could unwind itself very quickly because it's so complex, right? Yeah, right. Um, and so in, in that situation, the uh, the stores only have three days of food on the shelves and, you know, the trains stop running, the, the trucks stop running. We got to feed ourselves. So what skills do our kids need to know? They, they need know? to be they need to know how to uh, work a sword and take over a cruise ship. That's what they need. Yeah. Well, what movie is that? There's I don't know. No Let's cruise ship it. nearby. There should have been an 80s movie about that. There's no should've, cruise ship there. But I, I but do that, think Speed 2 was set on a cruise ship Speed instead, of a, instead of oh, a bus. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I don't remember that. Yeah. Was that an eighties movie? No, no that I was nineties. Okay, okay, what are you doing? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, sorry, wrong decade. Just stick to your genre. Right. So, being serious for a second. So, you know, there's that's that set of skills, right? And then there's, but I'm not sure those are the right skills or the most important skills, right? I would almost, I could also say, problem solving, cooper, you know, cooperation, knowing right. how to work with people, relationship Listening building, well. you know, being connected to nature. Not being addicted to devices in order to get you know life satisfaction, learning dopamine hits, learning how, on the communication front. I think learning how to deal with difficult people too. Right, um, learning how to remain calm and in crisis. trying yeah. situations. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so one area you know comes up for me is just this question: like, well, what are the most important skills that they need? Well, that know? and eating beetles. <laughs> All that and eating sure. beetles. Well, that's the thing is, I don't know. You need to develop a lot of skills around that. You just, if you're desperate enough, you're gonna fucking eat them, right? Okay. Sure. Are, we, are we talking about the insects or the rock band? I think the grubs are actually the nicest. <laughs> the part. question is, will they still be around by then? The beetles. The the rock band guys. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're, they're, who's left? It's just uh, Paul and Ringo now. That's right. But they're hanging on. Yeah. Um. But. But the other side of it is like, do you do you take away their childhood? You know, and also who who are they as people? Like but childhood nowadays goes on forever. It does. I'm still a child. In the old days, you're like you're like married at 13 or something like right. that, and you've gone through some like ritual by 12 and a half <laughs> where you become a man or a woman. My uh, my favorite Onion article was this one they published a long time ago. It was about this. Sudanese guy who's lamenting he's having a midlife crisis <laughs> at the he? age he's 14 <laughs> <laughs> so terrible <laughs> exactly yeah I mean we have this extended adolescence yeah yeah yeah, yeah in the United States it lasts until you're 87 <laughs> <laughs> do we ever grow up in the United States you know, a lot of us, I don't think, do. Yeah. I, I still haven't. I, I've stayed in diapers. I'm going to continue that from, from here on out. You just watch 80s reruns. Yeah, it's a comfortable life. <laughs> <laughs> watch bad uh, John Hughes movies while wearing diapers on my couch. I mean, I, th- I think that we, I mean, this is going to sound really simplistic, but I think the most important skill when I think about it for my kids I, that I hope would would help them in the future is, one, working with people. And two, not being rigid in their expectations about the future, right? Right, and and having a sense that like being part of something that's bigger than themselves, mm-hmm. and finding finding some kind of purpose in life, 
you know, because you, let's just say, because who knows how the, all this shit's going to unfold, you know, like I, I know people who have basically dropped out, you know, they've, they've taken their kids or if yeah, they choose not to have kids. People yeah. Do that a lot. Well, yeah, but I know people are doing it now and they're like, I'm not going to be part of this system. They're either preparing for the, in, you know, inevitable collapse that's over the horizon. That's going to be this ugly apocalyptic sort of scene, or they just don't want to be part of it. And it could be. Like you talk about the people that did it in the seventies, right? It's forty some years later, yeah. you know, and it's all just their bigger kids are attorneys, right? Exactly. <laughs> so, like, here, if we're going to invest all of this preparation into something that doesn't manifest itself very soon, so maybe, maybe our kids pursue something that is not directly related to like you know building lifeboats or right. feeding themselves and feeding their community, but they are of the mindset that their purpose you know, in life is to be part of something larger, then at least they have that mindset so that they could, you know, sh- I, shift. I think that's a really excellent point. I mean, uh, nobody who has a purpose driven life ever says, ah, oh, damn, I wish I hadn't done that. And it, uh, just made some more money or whatever. But, but I want to add to it too. There's, there's, um, two things that I try to instill with my daughter. And one is to just Start with uh, with that sense of gratitude, which you know I think you were talking about. We we live in this lucky time where things are abundant, and we're lucky in the place that we are and the um, support networks that that we've been given. And to just take a minute, recognize that, be thankful, and you know I think that's going to carry you a, a lot of places in your life. And the other thing I tell her all the time is. Why don't you go down to the store and get yourself a big bag of suck it up, you know? <laughs> and if they don't have any of that, look in the tough it out aisle and see if there's some of that. Because I do think there's the, you know... They don't even sell that stuff anymore, yeah, man. No, Sorry. It's, it's hard to find. But the the problem, you know, our, our lives have become so comfortable. Right. And everybody's so uh, wanting comfort. But right. I, I know some of the best times, you know, it's almost like in our society, you have to go on uncomfortable adventures to, right. to get that fix the, you know, because otherwise it's too easy. Oh, can I tell you a story about that? Hey, I'm always up for All a right. story. Okay. So I'm, I'm in, in my new national park in Peru and I'm at the like continental divide. So at the high Andes and we're like 12,000 feet or whatever. And there's a village called Paucartambo that is like, down like five miles to the main highway and then another 12 miles down the, into the valley. And we're, we're there. This is a group of, of researchers, scientists. We're studying the f- flora and change in the Andes and stuff. And this gaggle of kids shows up and it's like age 12 to two. <laughs> and they're all related. They're either brothers, sisters, or cousins. Yeah. And there's no adults. And they had walked five miles in from, <laughs> from the highway carrying everything they would need to survive for the next three days. And they just camped out with us. Yeah. And they would go. There were no adults. No adults. They go fetch water. They would, they would make their meals. They would, you know, change the, 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 the diapers or whatever they had. I don't know. They would help the toddlers go poo. That two year old was an incredible cook. I bet. Oh, amazing. (laughs) Yeah. And I was just thinking, what? Like they were just like the parents the, were just like, yeah, go ahead, go up to the go up to the refugio. Uh, yeah, bring the, back a mountains. jaguar if you yeah. can. And you yeah, know. I'll see you in a few days. And we're like, there's like there's like six of them, age twelve to two. Yeah. And I'm going. If this was in Yosemite, people would be calling child protective exactly. services, right? Yeah, and, and, no, and helicopters like, would be yeah. circling. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's if some people from like Fresno or whatever like <laughs> decided they'd like send their just kids drop their kids, kids off off in Yosemite and <laughs> say, they go See gambling. You later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they were totally awesome. Yeah, they were completely. Yeah, our kids are so fucked, man. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So like, a part of me is going. We are God, not prepared. I, I should have sent my kids to live with some family in Paucar Tombo for right. a couple of years, and then they would have been. Yeah. yeah. What, what did you say? What was get, uh, go go get, get you a big bag of suck it up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Get you a big bag of suck it up. I know. I think I don't do that enough with my kids. Right. You know, it's it's. Yeah, I mean, no excuses. You know, I I don't think I push them enough to suck it up. Well, sometimes yeah. it's not even pushing, right? It's just like. Yeah, you can do that yourself. I'm not going to coddle you. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to make this easy. And so what if it's uncomfortable? Like, deal with it. You know? Yeah. Right. I, I think that's a really good point. I think that that's probably a, a really important edge that applies no matter what. 
You right. know, no matter what issues you're talking about, just just helping kids be prepared to think that they one the things aren't all, aren't always easy, and two that they have the capacity to deal with yeah, those situations. Struggle through, yeah. yeah. You know, um, and we don't have to drop them off. You know, in some like remote, <laughs> right. you know, the top wilderness of a new national park. Yeah, right. I mean that'd be that'd be kind of cool. kind of cool. Yeah. It's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But there there could be smaller scale things that yeah. you could do to try to create that experience for them. You know, and it, I'm sure it, it instills a lot of confidence. I didn't have that much as a kid. I mean, what I did have as a, as a kid was the freedom to explore a lot more than I think kids generally have know, these days. Yeah. You know, I think that that's a major loss. But I wasn't, you know, I was pretty privileged and, and protected on some level. Although growing up in Israel, you know, I think that I was exposed to this sense of, of risk out there. Um, I have a strong memory of like I, I ran out and tried to pick up a paper bag that was on the sidewalk, you know, and my mom ran up to me and she slapped it on my hand wow, and whisked me away. And yeah. like the police came, they, you know, it was all about this could be a, a, a bomb, bomb yeah. you know. I thought it was a bag of poo that someone was going to set on fire. Yeah, well, that, I mean, that would have caused much more chaos. Right. Yeah, it was a bag of poo. Um <laughs> But you know, my my kids have never experienced anything no. like that. Right, mortal peril in yeah. the streets. I know. Right. Yeah, interesting. Well, but I mean, that does exist in the U.S. All, of course, too. Of and, course, uh, plenty. Yeah, of kids, plenty. kids who are scared, you know, trying to figure out what what route they take to get to school. Yeah, you know. Um, yeah, how do I keep from being brutalized day by day, yeah. living where I live? Yeah. You know? and, yeah. Uh, so I, you know, I'm not trying to say it's a comfortable life for everybody, but right. for those of us that found ourselves luckily in this, you know, place, uh, let's call it what it is, a place of privilege, uh, that was gained not of our own doing for the most part. Right. Um, we're born into it. You know, really. we, we, I think there is a little bit of a responsibility to at least help our kids understand that the world doesn't work that way for, for all of, for everybody. And maybe it shouldn't, shouldn't work that way for us and for them. Yeah. It's, um, it's a, it's a tricky one too, because, if you try and instill with in your kids an understanding of of their privilege and their fortune, and also try to help them recognize the the possibility or probability that that fortune won't continue, right? right? Or their life won't the continuity of their life, you know, shouldn't be taken for granted. There's all that guilt that comes, you know. Like my my son would probably hate me sharing the story, but when he figured out that parents that people have sex not just to make one kid right like right. you have sex once and that's your kid and boom you know that there are millions of sperm and it could have been any of those sperm and that parents are having sex maybe more than once to have a kid or maybe <laughs> wait, they're having it not to have a kid wait what I, what what that happens okay rob <laughs> I'll, I'll explain this to you later <laughs> well, i think i'm getting angry <laughs> <laughs> he he was mad he was really upset because for him Every the foundation of what he had felt kind of got pulled out from under him. He thought that you know, because we love him so much, and he knows that that we brought him into this world. It wasn't he a like rant. molded him from clay or something like that. No, he knew he knew what sex was. Okay, good. But I think he saw that there was this intention there, and there uh -huh. was like a direct path from A to B. Right. Right. There couldn't have been a C or a D or a E or whatever it was. Right. Yeah. So at first he was mad because like you guys you don't don't really love me, right? You guys were banging each other for yeah, other reasons. Yeah, I mean he wasn't yeah. saying that, but you know, <laughs> his hot loins and then <laughs> exactly. went and bada bang bada boom. And and then it went deeper for him because then he was thinking about and when you think about it, the the randomness of each of us being born, right? Yeah. It the 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 almost miraculous, and some people would say it is a miracle or it's you know God or whatever you know of. All of the generations that had to to continue, right? Every one of them to survive, you know, and for the kids to be born and to and for the kids to grow up and survive, especially when mortality rates were fifty percent or whatever, you know, from generation upon generation upon generation, you add all that shit up, and then you think about the fact that there's well, however many millions, billions of sperm, you know, and yeah, each time, is sacred. you know, <laughs> everyone is sacred. But, you know, 99.9999999% of them are shit out of luck, you know, yeah. that it's very likely he wouldn't have existed, not him, you know? Right. And when you re recognize that, if you're a, a bright person and you think about that, you're like, 
Holy fuck. Am I not special? <laughs> you know, you either think this had to be, right? You think you're inordinately lucky or you feel some kind of like guilt. And that's where he came to. He, he felt, felt guilt that he was the sperm that made yes, it. Yes. He felt terrible. <laughs> you, you know about how many all the other... babies that didn't exist. Oh, wow. I mean, really, he was carrying that, right? He's got to learn some math about but they would have been growth. they would have been slow, though. You know, he's like the fastest of that's them all. That's true. He's, but, <laughs> yeah. but the point is, you know, like when you open your mind to these things, you know, the improbability of life, the improbability of the fortune that you have, and you start, like, that's just an extreme example. I don't think all kids kind of make those mental right. calculations or go through that process. But when you recognize, you hear on the news, you know, about Syrian refugees, you know, and you see, you know, pictures of these things, right. you know, and, and you think... They're people, they're not things. Right. <laughs> I'm, t- I'm, think- I'm talking about war. But, oh, okay. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. I'm trying to get you sensitized. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. No, I can only think of them as things because otherwise it's too painful. Well, they're not Americans. They're things. They're things. <laughs> but... How do you care that? You right. know, and like, and we all went through this. We still go through this. You know, I have a hard time remembering what it was like for me as a child to see that kind of the, just the randomness of fate. Yeah, you know, and how do you hold that? Like, I'm incredibly fortunate, but then I'm going to hold on to the emotion of that and then still try to do something in the world. You know, it's easy to to understand why people are like. La, 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 la. Yeah. I'm not going to think about that. I think you all know? of us have to do that to some extent, or we'll just get worn out. Yeah. You can only be that intense with your feelings for so many hours a day. I guess I, I can't. I have to be shallow for quite a bit of it. Well, you see a lot of people that are involved in, in conservation biology, and it's like uh, too easy to go home and just start drinking. You know? It's yeah. like yeah. If, if, if your work every day is about something that's just gloomy and sad and it's, you know, it's going the wrong direction – if you're trying to conserve habitats and ecosystems and instead it's uh, oil palm plantations and, and uh, disappearing rhinos, then, you know, it's, it's a pretty depressing end of the day. Now, the, the guy that owns the oil palm plantations living it up pretty happily. But, but, but yeah, uh, you got to find a, a healthy way to deal with it. Unfortunately, that's somewhat on us as parents to help our kids find those healthy ways. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, damn, I wish I, I believed in a God that my kids could go to, to mm. church or shul or the mosque or whatever it is, you know, that they could that they could go and find solace in and 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 have a story. Yeah, you not even the, explain, you like, don't even have the god of consumerism and the shopping mall no. as a church. I know? think I think that's why they're so they're relatively speaking so few of us that live in this space, right? Because it, there's uncertainty, there's a lot of weight, there's um, there's a feeling alone. There's not a lot of reward, yeah. right? Other than maybe feeling like at least I know the truth, mm-hmm. you know, and. And the reward that we get from meeting, you know, knuckleheads like us, you know, right. uh, and, and feeling like we're part of a tribe uh, who oh, see this together. Well, what's interesting is I also think about the precious, I almost have a sense of the preciousness of life, uh, look, understanding how, how fortunate and fragile things are. When I do see things of beauty, I also recognize how precious that is and how fortunate I am to be able to recognize that and appreciate it. In that it, it, it's like if you're hungry, almost anything tastes good. So if you're concerned about these issues and yet you come upon something that is spectacular in the natural world, then maybe it hits you with even more impact. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's uh, – well, we've got a colleague, John DeGraff, who's starting a campaign around beauty and, uh, you know, it's a sort of a universal uh, appreciation of the beauty that we see around us every, every day in the natural world. Or, you know, even if you're in a, you know, a, a really rough looking, uh, you know, I don't know, say like a, an urban ghetto or something, you, you can still look up at the sky, yeah, right? Yeah. You can, uh, well, so yeah, sometimes, I mean, there are a lot of kids who grow up and never see the stars, yeah. but there's other kinds of beauty in those neighborhoods too. Yeah. But that, I, that, the point is I, I, I think that's right, Jason, is getting out, uh, seeing what you can see, experiencing what you can experience. And, uh, you know, nature is being exploited and, and it becomes a little less rich every passing year. But, wow, I, I love getting out in it. I, yeah. and, and my daughter's the same way. I, you, can, you can sense it when you, 
when you get somebody out and away from uh, the, like, we just have expansive conversations, we feel better, we, we've breathed better air, and right. we just feel closer and tighter. And I, I think that's... Um, it makes me wonder, like, yeah. that kids in Pau Cartambo, if we're so materially impoverished in our sense of the world, of the word impoverished, in many ways, they were so connected like they could, they could, they could get out in the nature and just live for days, and need relatively little things. They all slept together, wrapped in a blanket. They had a little pot, and they boil some potatoes in and and some vegetables, and and uh, they needed so little, and they and yet and and they were going out and experiencing nature. These are kids that lived in some rural town, but even them, like going out even a little further to this refugio, mm-hmm. was a big deal, and uh, they obviously. Sp- were invested in doing that. They walked miles. Yeah. And uh, so that that's interesting. That makes me think, you know, it's a universal craving for that experience of being connected to the natural world. Yeah, and exploring too. And exploring, you know, Not yeah. knowing what's around the next bend. I mean, that's... Uh, I think, that's, that's really I, I think our, our kids, it's, uh, you know, Bill McKibben is a P, uh, post-carbon issue fellow, wrote a great book called uh, Deep Economy. And... In it, I, I remember there's a sort of a passage talking about how people in East Asia, maybe China, um, for them getting a meal, you know, uh, an extra meal a week or an extra meal even a day that was protein based, you know, chicken or something or pork mm-hmm. was a big deal. It actually right. made a substantial quality of life improvement for them. Whereas having another interaction with yet another person in their space was not a qualitative benefit to them and the flip side is you know true for for us right. where god knows we don't need another fucking mcdonald's you know <laughs> happy meal or whatever you know like yeah. it's actually killing us you know right. to have that much protein animal protein to eat but meaningful wait wait, wait wait are you claiming there's animal protein in a mcdonald's happy meal <laughs> well yeah it just happens to be from a thousand different animals i thought it was just hooves and stuff <laughs> right <laughs> Okay, sorry. Yeah, so yeah, you're yeah, talking yeah. about collagen then. Yeah. Um, but, but you know, the point is that it's, in a sense, it's about balance, you know? Like, yeah. So how do you provide to, to kids who are materially impoverished, you know? They're, they're either suffering from malnutrition or they're suffering from lack of education or they're suffering from lack of access to whatever resources, including forms of entertainment, but doing it in a way where it's like that is not the end-all, be-all goal, but it's it's part of, you know, like an incremental addition to the right. to their quality of life that that could be done in maybe a sustained way, yeah. and and on the flip side, if we're all the way to this other extreme where, you know, and I think that this is true. I think we're starting to see the diminishing returns on on social connectivity, right. you know, uh, where so much interaction happens that way, and we get our dopamine hits from checking our messages and looking at Facebook or whatever the hell it is that we're doing that if we're actually pulled out into nature or pulled into a situation where those distractions are not available and we're just connecting with each other, it feeds a part of us that's just hungry. Right. Yeah. You know? yeah. You guys ever see that book, Last Child in the Woods? Mm. Uh, the, the author coined the term nature deficit disorder. Right. It makes that exact yeah. argument. Like that's the thing that's now missing or in short supply for most children. I mean, you just think about... I can think about my existence as a kid, uh, you know, wake up in a suburban house, walk about a couple hundred yards to the bus stop, driven to the school. You're there all day. Then you go out on a gravel or a blacktop playground and then come home. And And I remember the thing we would always do when we got home is we'd be outside, you know, play sports or, or go run off in the woods. Mm. And that was already disappearing at that time, you know, in the 80s. But now it's it's disappearing at a much faster rate and the that that's his argument that if you you know that's what children are missing longing for and and it's also kind of nefarious because you you if you miss it then it's not part of their existence well if they were to have kids you know what what are right. what do they know of nature they don't even know to to think about providing that yeah they don't know what they're missing yeah but I think it's nature. I think it's also human contact and human relationships yeah. and the sense of satisfaction maybe from having overcome a challenge or creating something, mm-hmm. you know, like I think that kids these days in the 
context that we're talking about, which is like we said earlier about Maslow's hierarchy of needs fairly high up there, they're, they're missing a lot of those things. So I guess to wrap it up, I, I'd, I'd want to ask each of you guys, you know, Jason, Rob, you know, what's, what's one thing if, if, uh, if either you were to do it over again or the thing that's like the edge for you right now with your kids that you feel like oh, that's a skill that I need to impart on them or a mindset that I need to, to help them hone for this future that's coming? Yeah, well, uh, I appreciate the question. I feel like I've said at least what's been on my mind lately, which uh, the first thing is to validate their feelings of sadness. And, you know, don't, as much as I want to comfort my daughter, I don't want to tell her lies or, or have her not understand that there's some, some things wrong. Now, I don't want to go too far, right? And I've told her that. I've said, I, I want to answer your questions. Um, I want to be honest with you, but I, I don't want you to, you know, have to take on more than, than what you can at this age. And again, she's 13 now. It's going to be different if you're dealing with an eight-year-old or a six-year-old. But I think it's, it's important to validate feelings without going too far and, in, in, uh, you know, uh, making them scared of the world. So that's, that's the one thing. Uh, the other piece I would say is have them do things. The smallest actions can be helpful. In fact, she she told me how she and a friend went out and gave muffins to people who are living on the streets. They baked a bunch of muffins, went out and you know, they were with an adult and, and went out and handed them out. And I was like, well, that, that's great. I mean, like if you have some empathy for the people around you and you can treat people well, it bodes well for treating your home well. Did she do that? Actually, was it in her head uh a reaction to the to the news about the rhino or is that disconnected i don't know it probably wasn't and it might not have been her idea either right. but you know i don't know but um but the, I, I think the point is getting out and doing things that have purpose and meaning helps you avoid getting to that cynical place that place of despair where you, you think it's all worthless and hopeless what we want are hopeful children who who are but have a grounding in reality mm-hmm well yeah. said. And what about you, Jason? No, I, I think a lot of that is like the doing and making real things. Like you were saying, your kids actually get this and they're like, why aren't we doing something about it? And I think that's it is, is give, give young people especially experiences where they, they, they can see the fruits of their labor, their efforts. And uh, so I think having, spending time with my kids to foster that and encourage that and help them along with that. But, but, I, but know that, know how to sort of, Encourage, but not 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 do it for him. I think uh, a couple of things we talked about it really resonate for me that we try to do, but I think could do a lot more. And that is connection in nature is, I think, so helpful for so many reasons. Because you know, one is that ad- addressing that nature uh, d- you know deficit, right? Um, and and how it, it, I I believe it if actually feeds an old part of ourselves, mm-hmm. right? Um, the other is understanding the natural world, understanding cycles and systems and, and seeing the web of life and learning how to cherish it, but also understanding that we're part of this larger web. And I think understanding na- natural systems and natural cycles is going to be very key for us as we're, we're dealing with limits, the limits, uh, you know, that, that, that we're facing. And then I think the other is, is being somehow helping them navigate that tension between recognizing what you were saying, Rob, about recognizing reality and being grounded in reality. Because I think if we're not grounded in reality, we're not going to be able to navigate our way into the the future that, that, that we're facing while also not being cynical. And I don't think there's a perfect answer there. I mean, frankly, you know, in the, in the context of, of the work that, that I do every day, you know, working at post government Institute, I'm constantly struggling with that, yeah. you know? Yeah. So just being able to like live in that space, you know, so that you're, you're prepared to run a marathon, not a sprint. You well, know? yeah. That's why we stockpile shopping carts. Yeah. <laughs> that and, and lots of alcohol. <laughs> That's our show. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to the podcast. And while you're at it, rate or review it at iTunes. That really helps get in front of more people. To learn more, visit postcarbon.org slash crazytown. And if you want to actually learn something instead of listening to us bozos, 
you should check out Post Carbon Institute's Think Resilience course. It's four hours, 20 bucks, and will seriously change the way you see the world. Catch you next time on the mean streets at Crazy Town. So guys, I want to introduce a new sponsor today I'm really excited about. Uh, I've been using them for a long time. I like diapers. Have you heard of them? <laughs> I'm wearing them right now. Awesome. Me too. <laughs> what about you, Rob? Well, uh, I, don't, I don't know the company, but you know, I really like diapers. I mean, the, the smell, the taste. Diapers just, are awesome. Oh, so this is a great product for you, Rob. Absolutely. Now, what's great about these diapers is that they're, um, they're, they're fully lined with plastic. And they're filled... <laughs> right with plastic and they're fully disposable disposable where uh landfills anywhere anywhere Just well whatever yeah. <laughs> i mean out of sight out of mind right yeah pacific gyre if you want oh right yeah. oh can you get the plastic wrapping alliance to ship it out there straight well, i want to use mine first <laughs> uh, here's what i'm really excited about guys that you didn't know about so there's a new subscription service for i like diapers okay and you know for just 19.95 a month they send you pre-filled diapers. <laughs> <laughs> pre-filled. Wow. Yeah. I've th- that that's I my life's done. I just want a big box of pre-filled diapers. Right. And you can even specify where they come from, what kind of person wore them. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah sweet. Yeah. I you know, parents these days are not going to need to teach their kids how to use the restroom. Oh, Why? Think, think how much easier it would have been raising your kids if you had I like diapers. Oh, let's just keep them all in diapers. Well, and we can all now convert our bathrooms into like TV rooms or, you know. I'm just going to store plastics room. in it. Oh, good idea. All right. So everybody, check out ilikediapers.com.